Yeah. BTB and GStreamer. Yep. Okay, so um, in order to save time, I can plan this presentation around the assumption that everybody in the room knows what the licensing software is, what open source is, and what the Linux platform is. So before I go any further, does anyone not know this? Or does anyone need some quick clarifications? Yes, no, okay. Um, so, um, for those of you who saw my talk in 2009, uh, you might uh, remember that I compared just to to a giant building cloud. Um, so, yeah, this talk is pretty much centered around PTV, but I'm uh, also going to cover the site of the giant cloud of the in general. Yeah. So, um, I won't go over the history of the PTV project since I already did that. I already did uh, that two years ago. So, uh, if you care about the history of the project, you can go look at the video recording of the 2009 or by a time machine or something. Anyway, you can find the link to the video recording on this huge URL or on my personal website. Okay, so uh, here's what I'd like to uh, let your appetite with today. So, to start up, um, this is a very nice view of the study of the next video editing. You can still see the various camps, the GStreamer camp, the NLT camp, and all those independent video editing applications. Um, just let me start something. Okay. So, yeah, um, all things considered, from the user's point of view, you see applications maturing, frameworks, ma frameworks maturing, a bunch of new weird things coming out of the cage and so on. And so, oh, by the way, don't be offended if I didn't list your favorite app in here. I'm just simplifying a lot in thinking in terms of engines. So anyway, you'll get to see all the other apps uh, later on. Uh, so this pretty much looks good, right? It looks like there's some kind of healthy competition going on and Various camps are advancing. Uh, not exactly. Are you guys ready for the cruel, shocking truth? Yeah. Okay. So, what happens is this. Welcome to the real world. Most people don't care about the little guys on the Linux map. You can see most of the cool kids playing happily on the table over there. And they're using like iMovie or Movie Maker or whatever came with the CD of their camcorder or whatever they could get from a shady guy in a shopping mall in Hong Kong. Uh, and the guys in blue, they're the guys from Avid and they're too busy ringing the cash register to even notice you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'll get back to the, the open source Linux video editors battlefield at the bottom in a few minutes. Uh, so for a few seconds, I'd like to take a look at this broader view uh, and ask the question, why don't those two worlds intersect with each other? Why are we not seeing, say, Premiere on the Linux battlefield? There are many, 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 many reasons for that, one of which is market share. I guess I should exclude smartphones from this figure because doing serious video editing on a smartphone is like kind of silly, but then at the same time, who would have thought a hundred years ago that we would have cameras embedded in phones and that the main use of a phone would be not making phone calls anyway. So uh, what you can see basically is a big, big majority uh, for Windows here. Linux has maybe 1 to 1.5% 1 of market share and according to the last trends I've seen. And in 2008, we passed 1 billion personal computers. And so when you think about it, 1.5% 1 of one of more than 1 billion computers is still a lot. It's about 15 million, millions, and that sounds about right, I guess. But what happens when you combine that with the fact that not everybody does video editing? What is the intersection of a Linux user and a video editor? Uh, according to my rough estimates, as according to Ubuntu's popularity contest that's about 4% of Ubuntu users use PTV. If you take other video editing software into account, we may have maybe 10% of Linux users. 
Anyway, as you may know, my data might be completely wrong. There are many problems with this statistic sample. Yada, yada. It's just it's just about ballpark figure for me to know that we are in a niche market. I mean, we're four percent of one percent. That you can't be more niche than that. Uh, is there still a need for this? I guess there is because there seems to be a sustained interest in PTV. Strangely. Uh, according to website statistics, there was like between 13 and 20,000 visitors per month. Uh, this, kind of, this graph is kind of outdated anyway. Um, so we covered the market share. So that's only one of the many reasons why open source video editors suck. Here's another one. History keeps repeating itself. Um, Recently, I've done some research and came up with a timeline of all the open source video editors I could find. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you've never heard of 90% of those apps in the timeline. That's because they failed. Uh, anyway, I mean, look at all those independent lines. They're all reinventing the wheel. And even the enduring ones, the ones that, uh, the ones that uh, survived the natural selection, they all pull in different, different, different directions. And the problem with that is that it fragments the resources. That is, the few developers that are crazy enough to try to make a video editor. And so, yeah, those are a couple of factors of failure I identified. I wrote a term paper on that. <laughs> <laughs> Targeting Windows and Mac, I mean, what the hell would you ever want to do with that? I mean, increases complexity, more bugs, more manpower wasted, competing with commercial offerings and, and having users that generally don't give it an open source sometimes, or that will complain that they cannot import their PowerPoint file into your video editor. And uh, anyway, um, another key point of failure is uh, thinking that it will be simple and that you will succeed where all the others failed and, uh, and thinking that it will only take a couple months um, if you think that you failed before you even it started and your competitors will outpace you before your first beta is out. So on the other hand, uh, the key factors of success, um, well I guess be open source, run on Linux, be easy to install, uh, support as many formats as possible. Uh, have a nice UI that is intuitive and pleasant to use. Don't crash all the time. Yeah. Have a team of uh, knowledgeable core developers to do the maintenance and the complex tasks. Uh, attract uh, contributors, uh, contributors to work on the cool features and foster a healthy community. For one thing, PTV is the default video editor, video editor on Ubuntu. Okay, that's not saying much, I guess. but it, kind of provides uh, some sort of legitimacy and validation for, maybe it's not complete crap. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, canonical estimates, that's Canonical, estimates its user base at 12 million users. That might take a drop with the recent events around GNOME. Anyway, what this means is someone who wants to contribute to uh, the video editor with the broadest potential for impacting the lives of as many people as possible needs to look no further than, P P than PTV since it's installed on millions of desktop computers, at least in the theory. Um, and that's probably not going to change anytime soon due to architectural or legal reasons. Um, I naively hope that we would see patches and contributions coming from Canonical and that being installed by default would mean that we would get more contributors. I guess that was kind of wishful thinking. Uh, anyway, <laughs> what makes PTV a worthwhile project? Um, the fact that it uses standard technologies like GStreamer, which we all love, I guess. Uh, it's pretty much the biggest, GStreamer is pretty much the biggest multimedia platform framework kind of thing on Linux and, and, and other platforms, I guess. Um, upstream, upstream first means that when you spot a significant problem, you fix it directly in GStreamer, which means it's better in the long term, but it also means that it takes a really long time to get there. So I think it has more chances of survival in the long term. And another good thing is 
PTV is basically a torture test for GStreamer in the sense that all the other GStreamer applications benefit from whatever bugs we might find in PTV and fix. Um, so in terms of user interface, I spend a lot of time thinking on PTV's design to make it really simple and intuitive while not limiting what you can do with it. Uh, yeah, GStreamer, we love GStreamer. Um, for those of you who are actually not familiar with GStreamer, it's basically a toolkit for software developers to deal with sounds, images, uh, videos, uh, and special effects and all that stuff. So what this means for PTV and other GStreamer apps is that you can get access to a huge combination of multimedia plugins. You can encode and decode pretty much anything except Danny's uh, ABCHD and MPEG-CS files um, if you have the right plugins installed. Anyway, and this means that you can use a wide variety of formats from the $100 pocket uh, flip flip-like video camcorder thing to the point and shoot and the DSLR. What's quite interesting these days is that those cheap point and shoots, the cheap point and shoot cameras allow you to record high definition footage that is much, much better than what I could do with the DV camcorder a couple of years ago that costed twice as much at least. Anyway, so great compatibility is great, of course, but it's not everything. Uh, design is important too, and it's not just aesthetics, it's a matter of thinking about how your users will interact better with your software, and trying to do better than, uh, let's do a clone of Adobe Premiere, or let's add an option from everything approach, and otherwise you end up with creeping features. It is, um, that's an actual screenshot from Sony Vegas, anyway, I described my point of view about options in 2009, so you can use a time machine and go see my talk. I won't be going over this in detail. Anyway, all those, all those things are completely useless. I tried to find a useful option there. It isn't. You need to write a lot of way files in Way64. Oh, yeah. And I totally need to choose if I want to show a splash screen at startup. I mean, oh yeah. Anyway, uh, in terms of UI design, PDV, I guess, is quite good thus far. Uh, the problems are the usual bugs that are hard to troubleshoot and take a long time to fix. And when presented when, with this user interface, most people think like PTV aims to be a clone of Windows Movie Maker or iMovie, and that's that. But um, that's not true. I, I mean, it aims to be much more than that. I just rewrote the roadmap on the wiki recently so that people wouldn't get the wrong idea. Yes, of course, it doesn't do much at the moment. That's because these things take a lot of time to implement. So the vision behind the project in, term of, in terms of design and feature set is much, much greater than what you can see in the current implementation, uh, in the current state of the software. And I believe you can design uh, a user interface that is both, both uh, intuitive and powerful. <coughs> that would suit both Joe Plumber and that cool kid who's going to make the next indie blockbuster thing. And so you, you really don't want to artificially limit creativity. Uh, and that's not a, that you're not in a commercial world thing. You don't want to segment the market into low and high end and try to sell to both at different prices. And anyway, um, is that enough? Not exactly, because you need a strong foundation, I mean, strong software foundations to attract new contributors. But getting those foundations built is real hard. Just like Linus once said, don't expect people to randomly just jump in and help you do it from the beginning. You need to get it almost working for them to be interested. So the way I see it, basically, it's like maintaining such a big project. It's like maintaining the International Space Station. You need professional core contributors that take care of the maintenance and complex internal development, while in order to attract external contributors that will tackle exciting stuff. Um, and one of the great things about being in a niche market is that uh, the, uh, our users are kind of hardcore. Uh, I guess you can see that as a good or bad thing. Uh, but then why are we not suddenly overwhelmed with patches and contributions? Um, 
part of the answer, I guess, is that uh, compared to a lot of other free and open source software out there, the users, which is the filmmakers, are usually not programmers. Only 2% of the visitors on the PTV website check out the contributing page. That's 2% of 4% of 1% folks. <laughs> And on the other hand, the software developers, they are usually not filmmakers, at least they are not anymore, because they're too busy developing software. So combine that with the fact that a video editor is a complex beast, and you have a vicious cycle. So what is the solution then? It's, it's easy, just sell the software, right? Not really, I mean, in theory you can try. In practice, pretty much nobody does this in free software. I mean. Even asking for donations, not sure that would work. Because most people with a brain would make a quick economic analysis and think, wait a minute, why should I pay for some incomplete app when I could spend $100 on a com commercial application that would do everything I want, probably, uh, without needing to wait 10 years? Um, so here come what I call the indirect competitors. Uh, the guys in the low-end segment, uh, they are the ones who worry me. Well, the guys at the high end too, they worry me because everybody's going to get it from like a torrent website or a shady guy in a supermarket alley in Hong Kong or something. So it's not really possible to think that you could have a direct revenue stream for the average user. And as Eugenia said a couple of years ago, and she, I quoted her two years ago too, uh, video editing is a complex problem that requires professional developers to work on it. Um, so you're in this strange situation where a developer costs $100,000 per year, and it means you have a choice, pick, picking it too, cheap, good, or fast. Picking uh, good and fast would mean that you'd have a strong business model around it, or really, really deep pockets. Um, so now you're in a better position to understand why we still haven't seen the perfect open source video editor rise in the last 10 years. Now that I've got you all depressed, let's look at the upside of things. Uh, PTV does have some sort of backing in the sense that there have been multiple stu students working on the project as part of Google's Summer of Code program. And there are some Collabora employees working on PTV in their spare time. Does that help? Does that make a significant difference? Yes, it seems so. Involvement from Collabora helped. And the various summers of code helped a lot. Example for last summer, uh, Thibault Betune uh, implemented video and audio effects, and they were integrated in, in PTV. But this is not yet released in a stable version. And just yet. Um, and Summers of Code help a lot in implementing major features. But we're always looking, of course, for new contributors. Uh, there's a nice set of instructions that I wrote on the website and the wiki. And there's a list of easy things to tackle for newcomers. And I'm really quite excited about what will be the result of this year's Summer of Code, as we will have four students working on PTV-related projects. Um, so those are some of the things they will be working on. Um, GES stands for GStreamer Editing Services. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, animated effects mean being able to change the properties of an effect over time. So you have, you say, for example, uh, go from black to white to, uh, to full color. And uh, Clip transformation is being able to easily rotate, crop, resize, pan, stuff, do stuff like that, backflips with, with the clips on the canvas. Um, titles is being able to create text onto your video instead of using like Inkscape and exporting a PNG and having a ton of bugs because of that. Um, but there's already some good work done for this, but it just needs someone to finish it. Um, Another feature is render profiles, which is being able to have a default set for easy templates to export to, say, DVD or YouTube or email or Blu-ray, iPod, smartphones or toasters, anything. So on a related note, uh, video uploading is also being worked on, is being able to have a wizard that renders your project and directly uploads to YouTube. 
and uh, one of the Summer of Code students, Feroze, already has a working implementation of this feature, so it just needs some polish because the UI is horrible. I mean, anyway, it's, it needs some testing, and then it can be integrated with all the rest, and it's going to be awesome. We'll be able to post uh, videos of uh, dogs on skateboards on YouTube. So, and we currently have some basic support for presets uh, in project settings, but not for rendering settings. And we don't provide a default list of those, a default set of those presets. So that's hopefully going to be fixed too. So in that list, you've probably been wondering what the hell is that optical flow thing. It's quite an ambitious uh, Summer of Code project for GStreamer that PTV might benefit from. From my understanding, it's being able to cut out parts of a scene and do compositing on top of that. And that would be managed semi-automatically, hence the optical flow thing. That means that instead of manually animating every single frame, the computer would do part of the work for you and by analyzing the visuals. And that means that if you want to do the next Die Hard or Star Wars movie, you can add big explosions and lightsabers without needing to edit every single frame in GIMP. Um, so what about GES? It's basically another abstraction layer that allows, allows you to create apps like PTV or Jokosher or Lombard uh, more easily. Uh, yeah, I can hear you saying, what, another library on top of all of this? Why? Uh, this is why, according to Edward. Uh, why do we need DGS? Basically because hacking on PTV still feels too complex. And I guess because nerds love libraries. Um, so, so, yeah. Let's recap, basically. Um, the current situation still sucks for most users. Hopefully, after GES is implemented, PTV will be able to ride ponies on rainbows and be happy ever after. Um, we are in an interesting situation, interesting times ahead, because we are all, well, not that we are all, oh, I am, I guess, living under the impending doom of being wiped from the surface of the earth by the crushing superiority of Lightworks, that proprietary app that is supposed to be open sourced. They said that a year ago or two. And uh, if it is indeed released as open source, and if it is really really, really good or not, maybe. I don't know, it will be really interesting to see also what comes out of this year's Sum of Code projects for PTV. So uh, yeah, there's a, the website has a really nice set of pages for new contributors. If you have uh, problems getting started, you can always feel free to come and see me. And uh, yeah, that was kind of a non-stop stream of blah, 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 blah. I don't know if are there are any questions. Any insults or maybe I can just reassure you about the nations, ask if the nations does work. Right. Um, yes, we got about seventy thousand euros of donations last year which enabled us to have two people work nearly full time for about fifty months in total in Greater. Um I must say that in my mind was what do you do with the donations? I did them in my bank accounts. I remember I still had the money for the developers when they've completed a lot of work. And this is also important, and this uh, ties into a lot of your points. Uh, releasing your stuff on Windows will easily trouble or maybe make the number of races ten times as much. Just, just check with the game guys how much of their monthly donation income comes from Windows users. And I, I understand the economic uh, reasoning, okay, I can get a professional app for $200, and so why should I pay $10 for an open source app? People like doing that. Uh, it, it, it really works. Okay, I, 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 I thought about that, and I was wondering, uh, well, first, but PC guys don't have an Android rating a port to Windows and Mac and stuff. I mean, I think I managed to keep the bug gates uh, on for them. Um, if there could be a Windows version, uh, I mean, you're, the people on Windows really want an open source video like 
things that you have when there is like so many choices of paths there. I mean, my strategy was to think we might want to concentrate on where there's a huge painful need on the Linux platform. They can download for, for, for free. They can download any version of for Windows for free, and they mostly do. But I don't know how many millions of downloads can get from Windows, but I do know that they get about once or twice a week, and Peter said a relatively minimal project. Oh, why isn't Peter available on Windows yet? I would really like to use it. My wife would like to use it, my girlfriend would like to use it, my dad would like to use it. It's that there really is a demand for people who don't want to steal software. And um, don't have the money to pay for professional help. Or don't trust professionals. So, uh, the game team is a big year. Well, I mean, I know you had a kind of corner. There's a link that comes on the CD to just say, you might say, oh, it's a. So, I know you have a stuff that usually comes with an app as well. And all those apps, they, they suck, they're, they're really well for it. So, if you manage to reduce the windows, you might get even more issues. Right. To cards. Um, one on the mapping project, and we also have uh, about 80% of users uh, from using Windows. And we do not put a lot of effort into the Windows part. Maybe we have a guy and here to install it and stuff like that. Um, surprisingly, little a lot of the time basically needs to go into it to make it workable. We actually made it strictly and button and stuff like that. Um, I don't think it would be that much of a number for PTV either. The complexity is not high. Well, I guess I have to. Another thing is that I have an experimental group concept patch for getting information in GStreamer. So I don't want to discuss that with you later. So, Adam, how did you guys, you guys were going to have a video editor, right? Can you figure out some kind of model? Yeah, well, there's a couple of things. I don't know if I get framed. That's not what I'm going to get framed. That's not what I'm going to get framed. For those who don't know, um, we're from Europe because of Charlotte. Um, so, uh, so along with Windows, uh, um, I guess sort of as a counter example, um, for those, some of you may know, we actually um, had a Windows port of Charlotte for a while. Um, and it was because actually uh, a potential donor from Google sort of stopped by Europe and said, hey, I'm excited about it. Uh, for a manager. And he wanted certain features, but he said he really wanted to work on Windows. So we actually did go down that path for a while. Um, and we had it working on Windows, I don't know, four releases in succession. And eventually, we, I think around about six months ago, we decided to discontinue the Windows port just because the time had disappeared from nowhere. And for us, it wasn't so trivial. I mean, we could, we could, we've actually had ports on um, Linux where we normally run. Um, on Windows, and then we even got it working on the Mac for like a day. And our basic experience was GCK on Linux is wonderful, of course. Um, on Windows, it kind of hobbles along, but there were, there were many small glitches. It depends on, to some degree on just how much polish you want. Um, on Mac, on the Mac OS, it's just broken. I mean, we, we couldn't get it to work well. Um, so our conclusion was there. We, we could have kept it alive, and again, maybe for money to come, we would have invested it, but we thought that would have been at least uh, one developer worth his time or, or something to look forward. Anyway, there was also worked on, I think, class on uh, an audio editor and a video editor, um, also based on Genome. Um, and um, the better for worse, Shotwell has been so successful, it sort of has taken all of our attention. Everybody who had audio projects on the whole, um, our experiences there were. were um, we actually found Xenon and worked pretty well for video. Um, audio, in some ways, is harder just because you have to think a lot about low latency. Um, and so trying to record uh, is, is tricky. And anyway, we can talk more about that later. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Okay. 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 Okay.